Here we go. Welcome once again to the Iron Man in Stockholm podcast. Not the usual studio because I'm out in the middle of the forest here doing a little bit of uh, renovations and that kind of thing. I ran away, right? Sport got that bad over the last uh, two or three weeks. I just had to run and hide in the forest. This week we've had um, Champions League semi-finals. I haven't watched a single minute of it. I think Manchester United beat Roma 5 or 6-2 last night. Kind of followed it online. Didn't watch a single minute of it. There's loads of telly. There's loads of internet here. That's how we're talking to. But I just couldn't bring myself to do it because over the last few weeks after you know a lifetime we'll be 50 years old this year and just i just had enough of the bullshit that goes on around it right and i fully accept that i'm part of that bullshit that goes on around it because that's what i do for a living i write about it but i do try to avoid some of these things but it has sort of killed what was left of the fan in me so this week I wanted to talk to somebody who's still very much a sports journalist and still very much a fan, still very much loves Manchester United, uh, giving out about them in particular, you'll notice from his, uh, his social feeds. Sean Sheehan from the Severe MMA and True Balls podcast, the pod god himself, um, as the emails start to pour in now from fans around the world. Um, Sean, how have you been over the last few weeks with this Super League crack? How did you respond to the news of that to begin with? Um, I probably responded differently to everyone else because I'm like that. I was thinking about this then. We've we've talked about soccer before a little bit, and I was very, I'm always very interested to get your take on it because you're very much from the you like the League of Ireland. You were around, and I was born in, in 1988, so I know nothing but the Premier League. When did it start? 92 or something? Yep. So I, I was only a young lad coming up. I was thinking, I, like, I was thinking about that. I know some of my first memories of, of soccer, like Alan Shearer. The, the, the 15 million transfer Figo signing for Real Madrid Ronaldo the Galacticos and in Man United coming through you know signing Varane and all, all of this so I've kind of been brought up with watching soccer and watching sport with the money in it but it's funny this, I, I'm going to do a bit of a Phil O'Connor story here but a kind of a I, 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 so when it comes to music, right? I'm a weirdo. I hear a song. Some, some people hear a song and they listen to it five times and go, "Oh, that's overplayed. I can't hear it anymore." I listen to a song hundred times, right? And it doesn't matter if it's a new song, an old song, or whatever. So the song in the last couple of weeks I've been listening to over and over is "American Pie" by Don McLean, right? I, I, that's a beautiful song, a lovely song. I've liked it before, but I never really kind of fell in love with the song before. And um, my niece. Is a, she's a great musician, a great artist and everything. And she willfully takes my Spotify and uses it and saw that I was listening to this song. And she know, she told me, do you know what that song is about? And I was like, no. So I went in and she told me about it and I looked into it a bit and I was like, you know, the day the music died, mm -hmm. it's about, you know, Buddy Holly and uh, Bobby Vallon, I think, and a couple more people died in the plane. Richie Vallon's the big bopper. Richie yeah. Vallon, sorry, yeah. So Richie Vallon, I'm sorry, my, my, uh, my Wikipedia is, uh, is showing off. But... <laughs> It's about that. And then it's also about, I think Don McLean came out only a few years ago and said it's about the day the music died, but also like music and things like that have been changing and kind of dying over a longer period. Mm. And that to me reminded me of Gary Neville coming on the television. It was like, this is the day football died. You know, when the ESL came out. And I'm I, I, like, I was thinking to myself when we were talking about, you know, on text and stuff like that. It's like, is this really the day football died? Or has football been dying as what people wanted to be a purely sporting entity mm. for decades and thinking about it there's absolutely no argument that it hasn't been dying for decades if you wanted to die that way now me personally again my opinion is irrelevant for a second but like if you look at the sport and where it's gone from Shearer and people probably go to the, the, the first million pound player or whatever it might be before that Shearer to Figo to to uh, the Brazilian Ronaldo, to Cristiano Ronaldo, to Neymar and Mbappe and Pogba and all of these players going for all of this money, even Harry Maguire and Virgil van Dijk and all of this. The, uh, you know, the sport has gone that way. The, mm. It's We are already in it. We're already on that mountain, on the way up to the very top, and we're not coming back down. Mm. It's only getting worse. And this to me, we can get into maybe intricacies and what it would mean for us and everything like that. But to me, I'm like, is everyone like Gary Neville? And I'm a big fan of Gary Neville. I think he's absolutely fantastic at, at his job. But is everyone just have, uh, do they have their head buried in the sand? Mm. Like, do they really have their head buried in the sand for what we are and what we're looking at mm. as, as football fans? And me personally, I buy into that. You know, I'm not a, like you and I kind of wish I was like you a little bit who can like enjoy the, the League of Ireland and who wants it to be, you know, nothing but sport, maybe even lads from Manchester playing lads from Liverpool and all this. 
that would and you know people coming in as well, but that would that would be great. But I I bought into it. I want Man United to spend two hundred million and buy Neymar or not Neymar Mbappe <laughs> or other players like that. So I bought into it. I was all for the Super League. I would way rather see Man United play Real Madrid than Burnley. I scrapped the Premier League. I don't care. Like I want to see better matches all the time. I'm one of these people. I'm I'm a little bit older than their target audience now, unfortunately. But th- that would be my opinion. But uh, that aside, and I know that's not realistic, and I know it hurts the teams and everything like that. And I can definitely understand where people are coming from. But the people who are saying those things, the the backing behind it. And what they have done themselves, even like Gary Neville bringing Salford up three or four divisions and pumping money into it. <laughs> like, what? what's the difference between that and doing it with Man United and Real Madrid and making them so much better? Like, in their leagues, they were winning it by miles, coming up and then winning uh, straight away again because of the money they put into it. Mm. So, in, in you, you, the question you asked me, what was my first reaction to it? That was my first reaction to it. It was like, are you serious? Is this a <laughs> serious reaction to this news? Like... I couldn't believe it. That was my first reaction to it, I suppose. There's an awful lot to unpack of what you said there. And you're also the only honest man that I've spoken to. Because on, on the level you're talking there, Manchester United playing Real Madrid, I was writing last week that nobody wants to see Burnley. Nothing against Burnley. One of my best friends is a Burnley supporter and has been a season ticket holder all his life. But nobody wants to see them, you know, because that's what we're dealing with now. And the re- the, the, one of the other reasons for wanting to talk to you is because of you understand where sport and entertainment meet, right? So just before we came on there, I got the news that the the draw for the World Cup, the Women's World Cup in New Zealand and Australia in 2023 was made. And I came up trumps because Sweden had been drawn against Ireland and Finland, which is perfect. perfect. (laughs) And the game was not yet poisoned to the extent where, now the Swedes won a silver medal at the last Olympics in Rio, right? Um, They've just, they've been a brilliant team as long as women's football has existed. But it's still not to the extent that uh, the whole thing is gerrymandered. Like Ireland could still beat them one nil with a Louise Quinn header, right? That's not beyond the bounds of possibility. Whereas if Ireland were to play, you know, Italy or Germany or whoever now, you just know what's going to happen there because the difference that money has made to the to football in those places. And that's the thing that got me this week about the uh, the Champions League semi final, Sean, is that who's in it? The teams with the most money in Europe mm-hmm. are there. Who's going to win uh, the the Premier League? The team with the most money. And last year was the same thing. When Liverpool finally spent money, Liverpool finally won a title. And the idea then somehow, to move the discussion on just a little bit, right? We talk about Pep Guardiola and we talk about Jurgen Klopp and we talk about Solskjaer and we talk about Nagelsmann and all these people, right? But the one thing they all have in common is they have shed loads of money to buy the best players for. Mm -hmm. So... You know, has it gotten to the stage now where, you know, Gary Neville seems to have missed the point entirely, you know, that the reason Man yeah. United aren't winning trophies is because they spent a lot of money on Harry Maguire that he wasn't worth, mm-hmm. whereas Liverpool spent a lot of money on Virgil van Dijk and he was worth it, and we've seen that this season, you know, so mm-hmm. when you look at that as a fan, because as I say, your, your Twitter feed when, my, uh, when Manchester United are playing, I don't watch the game, I just follow you, like it's just <laughs> hilarious to see how, how annoyed you get about it, especially with the players, but is that where we're at now, you know, do you sort of ignore the sort of the tactical aspect of it, you know, the youth setup and that kind of thing. Just go, look, get me a 200 million pound striker who's going to score 50 goals a year. Uh, no, but I think because that's maybe a unique thing to Man United fans because uh, Man United have been brought up with both of those things, I think. Like Man United had the Beckhams and the Skulls and the gigs and all coming true, but we also bought, you know, Cantona, bought uh, Varane, bought whoever else it might be all the way. So, I think as a Man United fan, and you know, you could say all teams do that, but I think Man United have really done that. You know, they've based their teams on kind of the youth setup. And like, I, I was, I was uh, tweeting their trolling Liverpool fans as I like to do a couple of months ago, uh, when they, they had you know two injuries and said the the whole league was was against them because two people <laughs> got injured, and they were like, oh, they couldn't believe they had to bring a youth player into their team. They were giving out about it. I, I feel like as Man United fans, and me especially, all of my friends are Man United fans. When Mason Greenwood gets a chance, we absolutely love it. When I know I'm mad we, we bought him in, but when a young player, when he gets a chance, we absolutely love it. Shola Shoratire, when he got a chance, I love that. But I also want to see, you know, I'd love us to sign Mbappe. I want us to sign, uh, like, there, look, there's the reality of it as well. Man United at the moment, we need a centre-back badly. Your boy, Victor Lindelof, hasn't been great. Although he's been a bit, a little bit better again this season, I think. I think he oh, needs World replacing. Against him. Lovely man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he is. But I think he needs replacing. Obviously, it looks like Cavani's staying on for another year now. But I think Man United need another striker. And if Harry Kane was available, obviously go out and get him. But like, I feel like all Man United fans... like like. I think some Man United fans would rather a Kane or even Ronaldo, there's rumours of that, 
almost before Haaland because I think we believe in Greenwood and we think a couple of years with a really experienced striker, maybe Greenwood at the age of 24, 25 in, well, that's a couple more years online. We'll be ready to take that. Mm. And I like that. I, 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 you know, as a Man United fan, and I think that's, that's what we've been built on uh, throughout the last 20 years or so. But I, I do want Man United to spend more. The problem is, well, with Man United as well, right, is when Man, when Liverpool spent money, right, they got these new owners and, okay, they sold uh, Coutinho, was it, and they spent that money in fairness. But with Man City, and Man City have done, made a beautiful team. I was I was talking to my friends the other day and I hate Man City because I like them so much. You know, I, I Ruben Diaz, one of the best defenders coming into the Premier League I've seen in years. Phil Foden, I think, is going to be the best player in the world in a couple of years. I love Bernardo Silva. I think he's one of the best players in the world, one of the most underrated players in the world. But they've all, you know, it's all been backed by money, by, you know, we know where it's coming from. With Man United, uh, there's always been a feeling with Man United that they've done it the right way. You know, they have earned their money by being a brilliant club on the field and by bringing a brilliant club off the field. With You know, there's nothing wrong with, you know, going to Asia and sending your product there, going to America. And send your, I, like, I don't see anything wrong with that. Pete, I'm in Ireland. Like, I'm not in Manchester. Like, I, I consume the product as well. I don't see anything wrong with that. And I feel like that's the right way through it rather than just money coming in, which I would actually kind of love now as well because the Glazers have come in and absolutely destroyed the club and taken that money out that Man United have kind of rightfully earned and robbed it from the themselves so like when man united spend money i don't feel as bad about it and i'm not coming out calling it financial doping like when liverpool do it, but i don't think it's as bad for man united maybe that's me being extremely biased but however it was interesting there how they sort of changed a little bit because if you, even if you go back to the 50s and the busby babes and all and at that stage like celtic won the, the first british club to win the european cup and everybody grew up within 10 miles of the ground kind of thing you know mm-hmm. so but that was a time when that happened in portuguese clubs and in spanish clubs and that but then you know even when united sort of first period of greatness in your lifetime it was you know the neville's skulls beckham but then they also bought roy Keane for 3.75 million pounds so money was still there then Cantona wasn't a huge i think he was only one and a half million or something from leeds so it wasn't huge Me money too. but they certainly sort of stole him as well you know and they got in Peter Schmeichel from Bromby and, and this kind of thing but to move the goalpost just a little bit right because what was bothering me all week one was two things one you mentioned was Mason Greenwood there and I was training with an Estonian black belt this year this guy's been doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu for 21 years right and it takes time to learn any sport properly right so when you see Greenwood coming up and Marcus Rashford coming up they're not the finished product you know they need to learn the game for, for that the time to sort of slow down a little bit but then mm-hmm. on the other side of the coin we see Jake Paul going into professional boxing he's made he's had three fights and he's made more money than most boxers and definitely most MMA fighters will in their lifetime mm-hmm. uh, yeah, how do you view that because I don't know did you even watch that fight when he took on um, who was, oh Ben Askren yeah I, yeah I did I, I watched that fight it was, well the bout I wouldn't call it a fight you're but... shameless altogether aren't you <laughs> <laughs> I am I don't give a shit um, <laughs> look the thing about Jake Paul is people are viewing this in I think the wrong way this is not a sports person just happening to get all this money this is a celebrity going into that sport and getting paid an awful lot to do it you know we've seen this in MMA before we've seen it with you know CM Punk and stuff like that the difference with MMA and boxing and combat sports is you can get paid for one night or two nights or three nights and you can get a huge amount of money and you don't need to be skilled enough to be the best in the world at it or to be good enough to earn your spot. I'll give you an example, right? Brock Lesnar, a, a great athlete, but he was an, an entertainer and he, you know his name got him to a lot of different places. He went to try out for the NFL and I think it was the, the, uh, the Vikings he went to try out for. And he went and he did, you know, because he's such a good athlete, I think he did pretty well. Almost, you know, got on a squad and then was let go. Didn't make it. If, and we saw what he did in MMA, he came and he made and he get, became a champion. So he's obviously very good at that. But that's the difference, I think, between combat sports and other sports, real sports, team sports. You can get there in combat sports based on who you are and your matchmaking. When it's one-on-one, it's very different. Like Brock Lesnar can't go out against, you know, the, the Dallas Cowboys and come up against some schlub. You know, he's going to be playing the best NFL players in the world. So if you're on his team and you're his coach, you're like saying, what am I doing? This guy is just completely letting us down. Where if you're Jake Paul, you can go in against the guy who had a hip replacement four months ago, is 
30 pounds overweight and was never a boxer in the first place. You know, that's what you could do. And people will eat it up because you're a celebrity with 100 million YouTube subscribers and people will come over from your YouTube because they know you, they like you or they hate you and they will watch you because of that. You already have that inbuilt following. You know, when I started Severe Man Podcast, right? If I had started it from nothing, we would have had maybe a few subscribers and maybe it would have grown. We had the Severe MMA website that had been around for a long time. We've been covering Irish MMA. We started the Severe MMA podcast and immediately all the Severe MMA fans subscribed to it mm. because we had that built up beforehand. We had people knew us, people knew where we were coming from. Graham and, and Andrew and all the lads had done great work and we came and we brought that audience immediately with us. At a very, obviously a very much smaller level, Jake Paul has done the same thing. He has his YouTube audience. He's gone into another world and he has, he's really, you can say what you want about Jake Paul, but he's intelligent in a lot of ways. He might be very stupid in other ways, but he realized he could translate that audience into one night of work and get a lot of money out of it. And in fairness, it's not just one night of work either because he has, uh, you know, he has prepared and done different things. But like, there's a difference between right professional in combat sports and professional in other sports because as i said there that match make and i just talked about or him fighting a basketball player you can have a professional fight against him you could probably have like a professional tennis match against him as well right mm. but it's not going to be on a tour you know it's not going to be with other professional tennis matches or with or you know if you you, you couldn't join the premier league it's it, like things are not happening like that there is an entry into combat sports that's not there for other people and the reason for that money obviously combat yeah. sports is it's entertainment it's sport and it's money it's prize fighting mm -hmm. and people can deny that if they want there is a meritocracy to mma and to boxing you know, like any other sport, but there's also uh, a, a side of it that has nothing got to do with meritocracy. And we usually see it. The, the, the problem with Jake Paul is we usually only see this with the very, very top. So Floyd Mayweather, he's, if he fights, right? And it, they'll take out the Logan Paul side of it for a second. If he fights the, the fourth best welterweight in the world, whoever it might be, and we watch that, nobody cares what belts are on the line. If Conor McGregor fights Nate Diaz, the, uh, the the second and third biggest selling fights of all time in the UFC, there were no belts on the line. Nobody cares. So it's once you get to that high level that people no longer really care about meritocracy. They care about the name. They care about who they want to watch. Maybe they care about the entertainment. That's, that's a fact. That's just the way it does it. Jake Paul, he brought that level of notoriety that you usually get with being a top fighter. And he brought it down to the bottom level of fighting and has still got the same reward. Maybe not as big, but he's he's done it really well. And look, you, uh, I do I like it? I'm not really. I don't really care. I'm not that offended by it. But you can't not understand it. If yeah. you understand, you're just burying your head in the sand. Like I think Daniel Carmi and some other people have done, and kind of buried their head in the sand about it. It's like I don't I don't see the point of that. I think it's similar with the the whole Super League thing. Uh, and it's it's just the way it is. But in combat sports, like. We can, all, I think, in soccer and with Gary Neville and all those thousands of fans coming out in soccer, sometimes we can willfully ignore the money, even though it's completely right in front of us. And we see it all the time. Man, I spent fucking 80 million on Harry Maguire. But you can't, you can't in combat sports. You absolutely can't. It's part of it. We see it all the time. We see negotiations before fight. We see John Jones talking about Conor McGregor talking about Jake Paul talking about it. it always has been. So I think that's the. The differential between two of them but make no mistake about it there's money all over uh, uh all over sports but the the difference is it doesn't necessarily need to be the highest of the high level in uh uh in combat sports a little bit like arsenal i suppose getting into the super league <laughs> actually there was one of those things that you said you started a, 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 on the same severe mma podcast channel on patreon you started doing this other news headlines this week and in one of them you were talking about journalism but you were also talking about th things like this about the super league and that and you've realized that you're kind of no longer the target audience for, you know, for Jake Paul mm. boxing or for the Super League. Like you, you said it there a little bit earlier, that you're just a little bit older probably than what the, the target audience for the Super League is. What led you to that realization, John? Uh, do you know what led me to that realization as well? I listened to a lot of Dave Meltzer and he's a fantastic podcast and he knows all about it. You know, a lot of things come from the wrestling business and he, the way he speaks about like television audiences and stuff like that. But like, 
I think, look, we, I was my generation. I'm the very last generation that grew up to the age of maybe ten without a computer. You know, without even a computer in school. I remember the first day, like we got computers in school. Maybe I was a little bit younger than ten, but like. I had no computer in my house. I remember uh, when I was going to secondary school, the, the principal told my mother, oh, geez, you want the computer now? And that was at the age, what, 12 years old. So my my childhood coming up, I had no computers. And it was, you know, it was television. If there was something on television, we'd watch it. And it's like younger people. I was talking about my niece earlier, and my nephew. They don't really watch anything on television. Everything they watch is, you know, Netflix or YouTube or whatever else it might be. So I think that's why... And there's two sides that the point I was making, I think, on that podcast was in future, that is the audience. And, at you know, now and in future, the present and in the future, that's the audience you have to target. And that's why I think people are changing things uh, and moving things around. You know, there was talks with the Super League before about making shorter halves or making into quarters because people don't have the, the attention span. You know, it's a TikTok world and everything like that. But I still think, say, my generation now from, say, 30 to whatever it might be there's still a good couple of decades at least left in the TV watching audience. And I feel like sometimes it feels like they're trying to move past it too quickly. We saw it with the UFC even signing with 11 sports there a while back and like, you know, they can't get on a TV platform and like, well, let's, let's kind of back out of this at the moment. And some sports are doing that as well. There was lots of talk of Amazon and Netflix. And I know there was a bit on Amazon and I know that the, the tennis has signed up to, I think it's Amazon as well and stuff, but there hasn't been as much of it, I think, as we would have expected in 2021. Now, I think by the time 2025 comes around, it might be a little bit different. Um, so I, I think people kind of have half realized that, but want to move on because I feel like they, in, in look in this business, in the TV business, it's, it's about being first as we see, like we see with the UFC bringing out their app and getting the, um, getting the uh, fight pass and with the WWE getting the WWE network. And then I think, you know, WWE, okay, it's not sports sports, but they're always in front of everyone else with things like this, with the business side of it. And what they did very intelligently. And I think that's what the super league were, we should have done. It was, they owned all their rights. They had all the WrestleManias for all the years, all the SummerSlams, all the Raws, all the SmackDowns, and they have it on this one app. And then they sold it there, what, six months ago or something like that, uh, to another app. And now it's on another app over in America. And they sold it for an absolutely astronomical fee, right? And that is the future, I think. The Premier League or whoever it might be need to own all their footage and have all those back matches and all the matches coming up in one slick package to all go online. Like imagine if the Super League got it right. They started online. They did it all online. There was no BT Sports, no Sky Sports. And they had this five years of their online package proving how much money it could earn. Mm -hmm. Imagine how much Netflix would buy that for or how much Amazon would buy that for. These people absolutely dying for content and live content as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's the future. But at the moment, my, my point on me, my generation and them not targeting me, I still think TV is there for the moment. And I still think it has a bit left in it. But we're at we're at a very interesting precipice, I think, because we are moving from my generation to the generation that all they know is computers and you know it's the 18 to what is it 18 to 49 that they are targeting and those people from 18 to say 32 are taking over you know it's going to be 18 to 35 soon it's going to be 18 to 40 soon who know nothing but computers mm -hmm. and that's a very very interesting topic i think in a very interesting time we have ahead of us to see where this whole business goes in sports somebody i know who works in the media business in new york was telling me that they weren't surprised at all by what happened with the Super League and they weren't surprised. They don't describe it as being cancelled, right? And this is not a soccer fan. This is just somebody who works with media rights. And they said, this is not over, right? This is coming. It's just that, you know, now it's been put off a little bit. Uh, they misread the room. Um, but at the moment, because of the pandemic, there's, there's an awful lot of things have changed and people reacted an awful lot more strongly than what they might have done if they were still going to matches, right? But that person was saying that 
all the talk about the Super League was to do with a TV deal. And this person does not believe for one second that there was ever a plan to have it on TV. They believe that they were going to go to one of the t- two big players that they mentioned. They didn't say that either of these was involved now, but they suggested that either Google or Amazon was the target, right? And that it would be the first global deal where there was a single price globally. So it doesn't matter if you're watching in a poor African or Asian country or if you're watching in a wealthy uh, European country like Ireland or Sweden, they were just going to go, right, it's going to cost X. You want to watch this, it's going to cost X. Just fucking pay it. And by that, in doing that, they will cut out so many middlemen, so many operators, so many deal brokers, so many agents, so many broadcasters, and they would retain the right together with the platform to put in whatever advertising they are. And that, Sean, is astronomical money that you're talking about and this is one of the things that we've seen in the ufc because i mean you've been covering the the sport of mixed martial arts for a long time right you were around when the ufc said to people right we're going to have one kit supplier so you're not going to be able to wear nike or under armor you're going to have to wear first reebok and now it's venom Um, Mm -hmm. and can you just go back to that for the listeners and just describe how that was that a shock to people at the time and why and what effect did it have on the fighters so the whole point of that, and a lot of things the UFC did at the time, was guess why? What's the team of this podcast? Money. Money. They wanted to sell up, and they did end up selling up. And now, yesterday, the they sold Endeavor, which was what is it, WME IMG at the time, and they were put on the the, the stock exchange. I don't know how that stuff works at all, though. But that that that's the reason they did it, and that's the the top and bottom of it. So they introduced drug testing into the sport. They, uh, as I said, they brought in this, but the, the UFC. One of the the UFC's major selling points is low wages, and that is that is as someone who who loves the sport and who watches these fighters all the time and has great admiration for them. The fact that Dim being badly paid is a selling point for the UFC. It just sticks in my craw. And I'm the sort of person who doesn't give a shit really about <laughs> about money and stuff, as we've seen from the rest of this podcast. But like. MMA, it's, it's maybe it's just because it's a little bit closer to me and stuff, but I that that to me is very annoying. And with the the, the kit deal, uh, the point you're making there is UFC fighters down through the years, and still some fighters outside of the UFC were able to like you go into a t-shirt and I'm you know a severe MMA podcast. I I say to to fighter A right here, come on, um, do you know what I'm going to sponsor you for this? I'll give you five hundred quid. Put my logo that swears it up there. Throw that on the back of your t-shirt as you walk down. They'll see you whipping off the t-shirt. I get some advertising, job done, you know, and maybe our man in Stockholm gives him another 500 quid, you know, and maybe uh, who, who have I, uh, Michael Jordan gives him another 500 quid, and, you know, maybe they have six or seven of them on it, they earn an extra five grand or something like that, and if you're Conor McGregor, maybe you earn an extra million quid, yeah. and if you're, you know, Chris Cyborg, maybe you earn 500,000, if you're, you know, Masvidal, you might earn 90 grand or something like that, and it was extra money for these people. The, what the UFC did was this looks dirty this doesn't look professional we need to be like Man United we need to have our white shorts we need to have our red top Paul Pogba you wouldn't see Paul Pogba going in with you know uh, the Severe Met podcast list across them you know do a Man United match given some of the things you've said about him over the years that's not so <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't blame him in fairness but uh, so that that's exactly what they did so they for the sake of making their look sport look cleaner so that they would have a better chance of selling it, the UFC did that. They took away the ability for those fighters to earn a little bit extra money while also paying them really badly and keeping their pay. Like the UFC, I think they've done it twice now. They have announced uh, increases in pay, right? So they go, I think they went first of all from eight and eight to, to start off. So if I'm signed to the UFC today, and my first contract was be if I show up and I make weight and I go in and I enter that fight and I throw one punch, I get eight grand, right? If I win that fight, I get another eight grand. So I get 16. Then it was changed from 10 and 10. You tend to show 20 if you win. And now I think the I, I think there was talks there a couple of weeks ago of increasing it from 12 to, to 12 and 12. That I'm like imagine that 24 grand to go in there and put your life on the line on the UFC when we've talked about all the money they're making from TV deals and from their their app and everything like that with people signing up it's actually it's crazy when you think about it the, the way that the, how like how badly they're uh, they're paying people and look you could say okay those people haven't earned their money yet they haven't uh, you know they haven't uh, made their name yet those people have earned their way there by being good enough to be signed to the UFC 
okay, I'm not saying go in and pay fighter, you know, the first fighter in the card a million quid, but once they get there, pay them that. The yeah. problem is when they get there, they're not getting paid that still. <laughs> you they're know, you have paid. you have to be a Conor McGregor. You have to be a John Jones to earn this astronomical money. Even some champions are not earning that. So that, that to me is a problem with the UFC. And one one thing as well, when they when they were saying when 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 they were doing the sale and when they went on the the stock market yesterday, Ari Emanuel, who people might know, uh, Ari Gold from Entourage, he's based on him. He is the 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 owner, the CEO, whatever you want to call him, of Endeavor. And he did an interview yesterday. And one thing that really, really uh, offends me recently is Dana White and him have this line. And they always say, there's never been a death or a serious injury in the UFC. Mm. And I'm like, did you did not see Chris Weidman at the weekend? And he snapped his leg in half. Yep. No. Or did they not read that story that Stephen Rocco did brilliantly about Spencer Fisher a couple of uh, a couple of weeks or a couple of months back now at this stage, where his whole life has changed because of the the suspected CTE he has and the brain injuries he has, where his memory is is absolutely shot and he can't do normal things with his family and he does bits of training with people and teaches them stuff, but his his memory like is that not a serious injury? Is that like to me that is as serious an injury as you can get? So. Uh, that the UFC they use these things they say these things an awful lot to earn more money and they are very outwardly about it and they're not shy in saying it at all and they're not shy in doing things like as you mentioned there with the with the with the kitty taking money out of the UFC uh fighters pockets and giving them nothing back you know they after a while with with the with the deal they started uh they started putting little monster logos on the fighter shorts and they put other certain things on it as well. And they have logos blasted all over the cage during the whole fight. They never stopped doing that. So like they never had a clean cage for any of those fights. So look, the UFC, they, they are one of the worst organizations, I suppose, for absolutely robbing their fighters blind and earning loads of money themselves. So yeah, it's, it, it, there's no sanctity in in, in MMA anyway, in, in all the sports, I suppose. Even when Conor McGregor fought uh, Floyd Mayweather, it, because of the contract that he has with the UFC, I don't know, have you ever seen yeah. a fighter contract with the UFC? I'm sure yeah, you've seen there, one. Have you? there, there was one going around all right, before. I think uh, um, John Nash over in Bloody Elbow does fantastic work, and he's a podcast called Show Money as well. So if anyone, uh, it's very complicated now to, to, I suppose, to talk about it here, but he does a great job of it and there was there was um there was a very interesting one that came out before i think it was rampage jackson's contract when talking about um pay-per-views and the amount of money they get for it so the, uh, these figures are wrong now but it's like this so like from no buys to two hundred thousand buys the if you have a pay-per-view deal and if you have a good pay-per-view deal you get like 75 cent from each buy or something yeah. like that and it costs like 70 quid if it's above that you get 250 from 500,000 to 700,000 if it's above 700,000 you get a five or something like that not not I don't think it's that much but that's the sort of way the UFC work it so basically the UFC are only paying you if you bring them in huge money and they yeah. can they can afford to give you a tiny slice of it but uh, that's the thing. it's yeah. like the crumbs for the table but when Conor was boxing uh, Mayweather he had to share the money that he got with the UFC just yeah. to be freed from his contract for that one night to fight you know and I remember mm-hmm. saying to somebody afterwards uh, there were like there was loads of journalists turned up there and we were in the tent afterwards in the media tent afterwards and journalists turned up and there was actually journalists there who were wondering you know oh why didn't conor mcgregor won <laughs> uh, why didn't conor mcgregor win i remember one of them asked me that question so oh you know why, why didn't conor win that you know he's a much younger man that kind of thing so it's very hard to fight when another man has his hand in your pocket you know and uh, <laughs> yeah. the, the guy didn't get the joke at all unfortunately but and you know and conor as well you know for a man who's made so much money in that you know it doesn't make to me a whole lot of business sense for a while there he was not just the biggest athlete in the USC, he was the biggest athlete in the world for a while there, around 2016, 2017, uh, around the Nate Diaz fights and when he beat Eddie Alvarez, the night he sat up in the cage at the start of November 2016, like he was the biggest athlete in the world at that point. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for all the money that he's made, you have to ask yourself, you know, if he couldn't have made more money if he had had the freedom to do so, which he didn't really have. But to round off the discussion, Sean, um, I was born in 1971. I remember seeing the first World Cup that I saw was 10 years before you were born, 1978 in Argentina. Mm -hmm. You were born the same year as Ray Houghton put the ball in the English net. You grew up with Alan Shearer. You grew up knowing nothing other than Manchester United's success. Mm -hmm. Uh, The WWF, WWE, the USC uh, was started shortly after you were born. Where do you see 
sport and your own love of it going from here? Because I know you're a huge lover of the, the Limerick Hurling team as well. Mm-hmm. In 10 years' time, what sport do you think you're going to be watching? Where will you be watching it and why will you be watching it? I, th- I think I'll be watching everything still, to be honest, because I, I, I can understand why people fall out of love with sport because they kind of get caught up with what's outside of it and with me look all those other sports i love them but i'm i'm embedded in mma you know every day of my life is you know talking to you about mma or talking to my own podcast recording a podcast or interviewing someone about mma and when mma you know as we've discussed there the people some people in mma the vast majority of people in MMA are lovely people the fans especially yeah. i think a lot of them are fantastic but there's some horrible people in mma and some horrible <laughs> stuff being done and it like it makes you hate the sport sometimes. Like there was a period I went through late last year where I just like I didn't want to do it anymore. I just didn't want uh, want to cover this sport anymore. And early last well, March or April last year when the whole COVID stuff started, and I think myself and a lot of people were calling for the UFC to look, lads, park this for a couple of months. Let's see what we need to do in terms of can we, you know, wear a, look, there's a period last year we all know. Is it should we be wearing masks? Should we not be wearing masks? Yeah. Should we go on out? Can we go outdoors? Can we go indoors? Can we have 10 people in the room? Can we have 100 people in the room? It and look, we found ways around that. The Premier League came back, all different sports came back, and look, all the sports that have come back have done it like very safely, right? Mm-hmm. So I think a, a lot of me and a lot of people included were calling for the UFC to just wait. We're not saying intra business, we're not saying wait for the coronavirus to go away in 2025 and come back, you know. We're saying, wait, give it a chance, find the proper protocols, and let's do it. Mm. And the UFC at the start were saying, fuck that. We are <laughs> going to an Indian resort uh, in uh, in America. We're going to, you know, we're going to fly all over the world. We're going to do this card wherever we can do it. Mm. Um, and look, that Disney came in. They told them not to do that. But when that happened, there was absolute like uh, the abuse i've never seen it like that before and all like we wanted at that stage me and other people was for us to step back keep people safe for a while and then bring the ufc back mm. we didn't want to uh, like for me personally maybe everyone wasn't like this but i all i wanted to do was was to kind of to uh, to see where the, it laid with the whole coronavirus and that to me kind of it it made me want to not talk about MMA anymore it made me want to not cover it anymore look that kind of pass and do you know what makes it pass and to, it's a long winded way I suppose of answering your question but what made that pass and what made like the way I was feeling towards the end of the year pass and I think towards the end of the year was because it was 26 events in a row so yeah. like six months and I was just drained from it and yeah. that was passive but what makes it pass is great fights you know at the end of the year Davidson Figueredo fought uh, Brandon Moreno and it was a fantastic fight and it was I thought it was a bit I thought it was a bit of a robbery in the judging cards right and I'm not used to saying that and I love talking about judging and stuff like that and that close fight talking about judging it made me think about nothing else but the fight and the judging of the fight and the the technique of the fight and that's what I love that's what I absolutely love you know you called me a fan and a journalist at at the start I would not call myself a journalist and I would be more than happy with people to call me a fan. And it's some people covering MMA, they hate when people call them fans. I'm a fan of soccer. I'm a fan of MMA. I don't give a shit. So I, I, that's why I love it. I love the sport itself. And I feel like some people, even some people covering the sport, they would rather talk about, you know, Floyd Mayweather fighting Logan Paul and the YouTube videos coming up to that rather than the, the bout itself or whatever else it might be. So for me, where will I be in 10 years? I'll be watching those sports. I'll be watching Limerick win their 15th All-Ireland in, or, in or all. Like, or, uh, I, I'll, be, I'll still be watching Man United. Like, there's nothing I love more than seeing someone like, like Wonderboy. I was a big fan of him. Seeing him coming through or seeing the likes of James Gallagher. I watched him as an amateur coming through and he's on the verge of, say, a Bellator title now. Or seeing Mason Greenwood and hear about him coming through and saying, oh, this young lad, he's scoring... You know, 25 goals and 24 games in the reserves. Is he going to get a game? And then he gets a game and he looks brilliant. And he looks like, like, the, the, me watch, watching Mason Greenwood last night, I know you didn't see the game, but he scored a goal. And it was, it was a, so he, the, the ball, a lovely ball played through by Cavani. He got it on the right wing. He came in and he turned from a left footed player to a right footed player and kicked the ball with his right foot and scored, right? Mm-hmm. And, it was, look, it took a deflection off the defender. The goalie almost saved it, but it went in the top corner. So you could look at it and say it's a scruffy enough goal. 
But if you look at it, and before he even kicks the ball, the way he adjusts from being a South Bar to an Orthodox, you know, I I saw that and that movement. That's the sort of thing I'm like, God Almighty, there aren't many athletes ever that can do that so effortlessly. Someone like a David Clifford playing for Kerry, kick off his left, kick off his right, or Gooch. People like them, I love watching people like them, like athletes. Like I have a LeBron James top on here. I have no interest in the the Miami Heat. Like watching him, I, I absolutely love it. That's the sort of thing that I think if if I lose the love for that, I'll give it all up and I won't watch sports anymore. But that's the reason I watch sports. That's the reason I continue to watch sports, and that's the reason I love watching sports. And like it just so happens, my one love. If Limerick were rubbish and they have been for a long time, don't get me wrong, I would still watch them and still support them and still be devastated when they lost and did, you know joyous when they won. But it just so happens we have like the most beautiful Ireland team. That's that's ever happened. Thanks to JP, but man, this is money. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, that that I've nothing that's ever made me as happy as that. To be honest, it's mm-hmm. I, like I wear my whole life. My my mother and father got married in 1973, and uh, they missed. Uh, they missed the match because of their honeymoon. And that was the last time that Limerick won the All-Ireland and then they won it again in, in 2018. And uh, it was I, I remember talking to one of my friends uh, Christmas afterwards when we used to be able to go to pubs at that time. And uh, he said to me, I had, I had agreed with myself that we'd never win it. You know, I had I had agreed that we would never win the All Ireland, and, and I kind of said to me too. You know, I remember back at Bebo on the day I had this thing up. If we win the All Ireland, I'm gonna do this and this and this and this, <laughs> and uh, and then I I didn't do half of it. But anyway, but, but uh, that that's the stuff like you live for. If I know that my friend Ar- Ar- you know Ari Luani over in America, he loves the Knicks, and he's like, oh, I want to see him win. I want to see him win the championship, and I can feel like that. And if you're you know, a baseball fan or if you're a soccer fan or whatever and you want to see your team win or you want to see something happen, like waiting for that and, you know, preparing for it and then it happening, that's the sort of thing that we can still have in sport and we can, st- we look, we can, we can talk about the money and we can talk about everything, you know, that goes on in sport, but we can still, when the game starts, we can ignore it for a little minute and look, let ourselves ignore it and watch the game and support our team and then when we do it, when we get to the very top, we can enjoy it. And that's uh, that's what will keep me going. There are still moments of beauty that money can't buy. Sean Sheehan, thanks very much for taking part. I shall talk to you very soon and I shall talk to you all next week. Uh, have a great week, wherever you may be.